Ruby Volume 8 just premiered with its first episode, Divide, and I have a lot to say about it. It's time for another Writer's Analysis, brought to you by Lars from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel. By novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. So let's just jump right into this analysis, because I have a whole lot of good stuff to say, and some stuff that just plain irked me as well. But overall, I thought it was a great start to the season, and that opening number was fantastic. The word that sums up both my praise and my criticism for this episode is... Continuity. We pick up right where we left off at the end of Volume 7, and I do like how the tables have turned a little on Team Ruby, and that they are now hiding and are on the defensive within Mantle, which as we can see has been largely abandoned by Atlas, and now the city of Atlas is under martial law. The tension in this episode is a great build-up on what we saw in Volume 7. In my review for the previous season, I said that I had a little bit of fear for Team Ruby because they just got off so easy when facing the ace operatives where were the consequences where was the tension where was the uh will they won't they win something that you really need in order to pull off a dark grim finale so i'm happy to see that my fears in that regard have been largely allayed due to the incredible opening that we get at the very beginning of this episode, which starts with Cinder meeting Salem. And we get to now see this entire Dark Kingdom descending upon Atlas. And with Team Ruby driven underground, we see how monumental the task is ahead of them. With Ironwood opposing them, and with the Grim coming, the board is perfectly set against our heroes. So let me give credit where credit is due. The writers, the animators, and the people behind the music have all done a phenomenal job in building upon the ending that we were given in Volume 7. It's actually harder to pull off than it looks to pick up where the last chapter left off trying to sustain the atmosphere, build on what we've already gotten. This is one of the reasons why the second book in most trilogies is usually considered the weakest, because the writer fails to maintain and build on the ending of the first book. But bravo Team Rooster Teeth, you guys have done it. This was a great bridge episode between the two volumes. However, continuity also serves as a stumbling block for this episode. And that is easily manifested with the characters Yang, Nora, and Ren. And just a quick mini rant here, I hate what's been done to Yang's character. I've said it before and I'll proudly say it again, Yang is my favorite character in the entire series. Volumes 1-4 through four build her up as the spunky tank character who dishes out punishment and endearing quips with all the sass of a bombastic blonde. I love the way she carries others throughout their trials, she stands up for them, and she is the emotional rock to the group. Her fall in Volume 3 and her rise to recovery in Volume 4 also hit me on a personal level, being someone who, outside of his YouTube personality, has had to deal with his own injuries and disabilities and turning them to strengths. Those are things that are just so personable and applicable. It's one of the reasons why I adore Yang's character. But Volume 5 retconned just practically all of that about her character. She went from spunky to angsty and inexplicably hating authority, whereas in Volume 4, she was honestly upset about being kept in the dark and feeling like she was abandoned by her friends and by her sister. And it would look like at the end of Volume 4 that she's the Phoenix Rising because she's going after Ruby. She has gotten back that spunk. We see Yang, we see the character that we love finally returning, but no! Very first episode of Volume 5, who do we get? We get this angsty teenager who is on a ridiculous side quest to find her mom, all for the plot device of finding Weiss and reuniting with her. There's literally no other reason for this. In fact, everything surrounding Raven could have been done without Yang being introduced. Oh my gosh. Like, ugh. Volume 5 is horrible for Yang. And what we honestly see here at the beginning of Volume 8 is that we're not developing the Yang of the earlier seasons, but the Yang of Volume 5, who is honestly a horrible Yang. I mean, look at it. We have Yang openly opposing Ruby. And for what reason? Tell me under what other circumstance in any other time of the show would Yang have said these kinds of things to Ruby, have shot down Ruby, and really stood in her way? Like, 
we don't really get that. And most of these problems are Yang's doing, and yet she doesn't own up to that. This is the girl who owned up to her own faults in Volume 2, who was willing to overcome her depression and her injuries in Volume 4. Give me that Yang back, please. I can't, I just can't with this right here. That, ah, oh, it irks me. It's one very small moment at the beginning of the episode, but it really highlighted that we have a very different character right here who does not mesh with who she once was, and we don't have an explanation for how she became that way. It's all very inexplicable. As for Ren and Nora, I am happy that we finally get a clearer view into their own personal divide that they have different visions of what is possible. Ren is honestly taking the more pessimistic path and Nora is taking the more positive. That is actually a really good setup and I like it. But why wasn't this divide between them explained in Volume 7? It was all so vague. Instead, we just got these angsty teenagers with their love drama, no explanation, and with a kind of resolution, which now was obviously pointless because they're breaking up once again honestly the continuity right here just wasn't good for these three characters at least within this episode and that was one of the things that just irked me the most so if you want your story to remain strong as it progresses if you want your characters to properly develop take care of each individual arc and make sure the continuity fits now that rant out of the way, let's return to the villains for a quick bit. We finally got a bit of Cinder's past, and yep, the Cinderella story is confirmed, as if there was any doubt. But that claw scratching, oh, it was so good. It was a fantastic detail that bespeaks Cinder's imprisonment to her own past and the inability to let go. This is the source of her rage and hunger, and her interactions with the other villains was perfect. The way she shut down Emerald, the way that she lied about how she got the relic of knowledge, and the way she stands in awe, fear, and envy of Salem. For her part, Salem is playing the long game, and it is great to see a main villain in all of her glory, providing little hints to her plans and how she is perfectly in control. I love when a villain has every reason to be confident, and they know it. And if I can throw out there a quick theory, she's not going to order Cinder to go after Penny and the Staff of Creation just yet, because she's going to use her whale to swallow Atlas whole and attack the city from all sides. And that is how Team Ruby is going to defeat the Great Beast, by dropping the city of Atlas right through its stomach. That is my theory. I am sticking to it until we see otherwise. And everything as far as the bad guys go was just really well set up and executed. So honestly, no complaints there. Now, turning back to the heroes, I do like how they are all taking different missions. There's a lot that needs to be done in order to protect the people of Mantle and Atlas. However, the way in which they got there was not exactly my favorite. Now, working with Robin's people is a really good way to make a highly mismanaged group from Volume 7 become relevant and developed without shoehorning them later into the volume. However, the argument between the Huntresses honestly felt forced. After learning that Salem is coming with a massive army, it just feels strange for Yang and Ren to take the simple approach and only really try to save Mantle. And Oscar saying that he made all the wrong choices earlier in Volume 7 is honestly a reasonable reaction for the young boy. But again, it just felt forced. It just, I don't know, maybe it was the voice acting, maybe it was the way that it was worded, I'm not exactly certain. And why did they imply an important conversation between him and Ozpin off screen? It almost comes across like a bad joke. But what really got me slamming my head into my laptop was the asinine plan to get all the people off of Mantle and into the crater. Come on, guys! You are facing the threat of the staff getting stolen! Are you sure you want to put everyone into a position where they could get squashed flatter than pancakes? Still, that being said, I am very interested in seeing how the volume plays out from here and with everyone splitting up. There is a lot of potential for some great story beats and some great character progression. Now, let's talk about General Ironwood. This man has finally fallen. The Tin Man without his heart, killing one of the council members in cold blood was perfect. And I actually really like James Ironwood as a character, 
but I understand why he's becoming the man that he is, and I can actually sympathize with his way of thinking, even though I don't agree with it. And that bespeaks great writing for this character and his motivations. The way he's setting everything up, commanding Winter's loyalty, and setting up the Ace operatives to want revenge for the death of Clover is so cold and calculated. I loved that scene. This is how you set up drama and proper infighting for a good war arc. On the world building side of things, we've gotten to see more of Salem's control over the Grimm, particularly the large whale, which is really cool. It says a lot about the cool dark magic that she has. And this massive whale alone is just giving me serious Dreadnought vibes from Destiny. I like that we finally also get to see the plight of the Faunus in Mantle, hiding out in the slums. But again, it is a shame that we didn't get this in Volume 7. Seeing the slums could have been a much better moment to cement Blake's position as an advocate for equality, and Weiss could redeem herself to the Faunus rather than just simply talking to the high and mighty people of Atlas. So we'll just have to see how the current volume does things, if it does anything more with this, with the situation in the slums, because I think that that's a really good opportunity for those characters. Now, I really want to take a moment to break down the opening number to this volume. It's clear that they're going for Volume 3 vibes, and I personally enjoyed it. Now, I'm clued into a lot of bad that's going to be happening this season, but there's more than that. We have a lot of foreshadowing to the current predicament of the friends splitting up and doing their own things. Ren and Nora's strained relationship will be one of the main subplots, and Mantle is going to become a bloody battlefield. Winter and Weiss will be put at odds against each other, and ultimately it is their family that will hang in the balance. I think for Weiss that this is the real arc for her character this season, and I love the imagery of Salem and Ironwood at the chessboard, with Salem's pieces all in motion while Ironwood's turn to dust and ash. His actions will only further isolate him until he is alone before the impossible force. Oscar must confront both the man in his head and said man's ex-wife, which yeah, it's pretty easy to assume that he'll get kidnapped by some kind of wolf, beast, or dog or something like that and taken to Salem personally. Actually, I want Oscar to get swallowed up by some major wolf because that would provide a chance for Ruby to pull a little Red Riding Hood fairy tale right here by cutting him free from the belly of a wolf. I just think that that'd be really awesome to see. Then of course at the end of the OP we have the girls falling through the ground and into a grim filled darkness as hope and light fades away with happy ever after changing to happy never again. Now, while this season is setting itself up to be the next volume 3, I'll give a prediction right here. Atlas will fall, preferably right through the whale's stomach, killing it. A great way for the hubris of man and Ozpin to counter Salem's own smug confidence, in that they destroy each other, symbolically showing that the small and simple souls of Ruby and her friends are the true victors and the hope of Remnant's future. And getting there does hinge on Cinder. We see her walking through the carnage of battle, ignoring Emerald and Neo before becoming consumed with pain and rage. In a previous video, I explained what I believe the grim grafting means for Cinder and what could happen next. Watch the video if you want all the details, but in short, Cinder is being eaten alive by the arm because her own greed and rage aren't enough to keep it at bay, which means for her own survival, Cinder must disobey Salem, and she will be the wrench in the otherwise perfect plan and strategy that Salem has. Episode 1 of Volume 8, Divide, has given us a lot to think about, and I'm excited to see where the volume goes from here. Let me know what you thought about the first episode in this season, and tell me what you're expecting for Volume 8. And in the meantime, please feel free to check out our other Ruby videos. And if you are a writer and looking for some more advice or help with your stories, please check out our podcast, Camille's Harem, found on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, The Works. You can also have in-depth discussions with us over at our subreddit. Links for all of those are in the description. And until the next video, y'all, tschüss.